Okay, well, good morning, Zoomers, and welcome to our Mount Pleasant Zoom service at home. Uh, thank you for joining us, and if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. It's great. To, it's really great uh, to see you. It's what a wonderful, beautiful morning um, that we have. It's uh, God has blessed us with a wonderful day. And if anyone who doesn't know, not know me, and for the purposes of the YouTube recording, my name is John McGarrigal, and I'm a deacon at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Blackwood. And this morning, as we know, we're joined by Reverend Mark. Mark's going to be bringing us the Lord's message. So thank you ever so much, Mark, and uh, pleased that you are on the mend and uh, and is as well. So that's really a blessing, a blessing to hear. If anyone hasn't got a Bible, we've got time to grab one, and it'll be the reading. It will be from Luke chapter ten, and Graham will be kindly leading us in prayer. And Graham, hopefully, I've got that right. <laughs> I've, got, uh, I've got brilliant, excellent, and Karen, as usual, will be whizzing around behind the scenes on Zoom making sure all the technical stuff works and making sure that we have a smooth service. So thanks to everybody who is taking part this morning. And as I said, it's a beautiful morning. And of course, it's Mothering Sunday. So it's a wonderful, I hope you're all having a wonderful day. I hope you've all been showered with gifts and you're being spoiled and you've got chocolates and, uh, and flowers and you'll be taken out to lunch and really looked after. And you really are a blessing to us all. And we uh, lift you up to God and give thanks for all the mothers and mums of this world, um, but also want to lift up all women. We, all women are a blessing. So uh, again, we give thanks to them all. And talking of blessings, this week I was blessed on Thursday evening when uh, Karen and myself, we joined the online Baptist Union of Wales uh, meeting. And there, there was the launch of Ron Spillard's book, How Long Until, and that was a real blessed evening that was, where Ron was interviewed by uh, uh, Tim Moody, and it really was encouraging and uplifting. It really was a great evening. So it's great to see you. It's a lovely, beautiful morning. Hope you're having a good day and, uh, and you've had a good week. So before we get into the main part of our service, let's open in prayer. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let's settle our minds and our hearts and our spirits and let's focus on our Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today and this time of worship and fellowship together. We thank you for the beautiful weather you have blessed us with on this Mother's Day. We thank you for both of our services and pray that you bless them and all those who are taking part. We thank you for Cecile for reading to us and Graham leading us in prayer. We thank you for our message this morning and Mark who is giving us your word and giving us the message that you have put on his heart. We thank you for the message last week where we explored the passage in Luke about the fig tree bearing no fruit and the gardener wanting to care for it, to give it the opportunity to yield fruit once more. We thank you for our second opportunities and chances you have given us to bear fruit in, our, in, in your name. And we thank you for Jesus who cares for us. Even when we fail, he is always there. Even when we feel that we are alone, he is always there caring for us. And he paid the ultimate sacrifice for his love for us. This morning we lift up and give thanks to all the mothers on this special day. We thank you for them and pray your blessing for them. We also remember our mums who may not still be with us. We think about them, we love them and we remember them always. We continue to lift up to you the conflict in Ukraine and the terrible suffering of all those who have been affected. We pray for peace and a resolution. We pray for the aid workers, the medical teams, the charities, trying to bring healing and care into the situation. Please protect them. And we pray for the escalating humanitarian crisis of those leaving the area and going to other countries. You taught us to love thy neighbour. And I pray that in whatever way possible, we will follow your teaching and be the best neighbour we can. And we will care and be there for them. So as we come before you this morning with these difficult, distressing matters on our hearts, 
We come with the hope that only you can bring and we thank you. We come to worship you and pray that you are with us this morning. In the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And our first song this morning is one I remember when uh, when I was growing up in school and we sung this many times in our assemblies. And, uh, and maybe you'll remember it as well. And it's entitled When I Needed a Neighbour. Thank you, Karen. When I needed a neighbor, were you there? Were you there? When I needed a neighbor, were you there? And the creed and the color and the name won't matter, were you there? I was hungry and thirsty, were you there? Were you there? I was hungry and thirsty, were you there? And the creed and the colour and the name won't matter, were you there? I was cold, I was naked, were you there? Were you there? I was cold, I was naked, were you there? And the creed and the colour and the name won't matter, were you there? I needed a shelter, were you there, were you there? When I needed a shelter, were you there? And the creed and the colour and the name won't matter, were you there? When I needed a healer, were you there, were you there? When I needed a healer, were you there? That's a song I remember very well in school and I uh, hope uh, you remember that song also when I needed a neighbour. So I noticed this morning, um, I'll give you those now, Sandra Bray has kindly provided me with those and so on Tuesday there will be the usual tea break at 10.30 on Zoom that Karen will be hosting. Um, unfortunately it isn't possible to open the church on Wednesday as Sue Thomas um, and Sandra had planned in order to be open for prayer, but we'll be opening the following week between two and three o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, we can still all pray at home during that time. So the church won't be open for prayer this week. As mentioned last week, our church members meeting will take place this coming Thursday at 7.30 p.m. So this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. And that's, that's both here, um, in the, or both here online and also in the building. And the minutes and the agenda are being emailed out. But for those who prepare a paper copy, Sandra uh, will bring some with her. So uh, they can, uh, anyone can speak to Sandra um, during the week to, to get a copy of those. If anyone is going to the building, they'll be available there on the evening. Uh, Reverend Mark has been re recovering from COVID and has been able to prepare the next set of daily readings, taking us towards Easter. So if you'd like a paper copy, they'll be available in the table in the conservatory and I find that when those are emailed to me I always print them out anyway because I find them easier to, to read actually in front of me on paper rather than uh, in front of me on a screen it's not everyone's the same but uh, that's what I that's what I prefer doing. Another reminder for our diaries is that on Monday Thursday at 7 30 we'll be having a service um, in the building which will include communion and finally if anyone wishes to make a donation to the DEC appeal 
please could you let Susan Steele have it before the end of this month? So if you could do that before the end of the month, please. Okay, let's have our next song, which is Praise to the Lord, after which Cecile will then be reading from Luke chapter 10, and then Graham will lead us in prayer. But next verse, praise to the Lord. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. <clears throat> Thank you. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Let's pray. <clears throat> 
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day for your love and mercy towards us, your children. For that unconditional love expressed in the giving of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that your love and grace is permeated throughout our world by the giving of your Holy Spirit. And so we pray for our world, our communities, and the coming of your kingdom. Lord, for a world at war with itself and against your kingdom values, we pray for peace that is lasting and deep. A peace that does not depend on human power and authority, but is founded on submission to your word and acknowledgement of your sovereignty. We pray for world leaders and governments that find their good intentions hijacked by circumstances and who become desperate to hold on to their position and power. We pray for those leaders who use their power for their own ends and ignore the suffering of their people. We pray for those leaders who have a vision of a world at peace and an end to injustice and suffering but become disillusioned with the limitation of humanity's ability to achieve it. Lord, in your mercy, strengthen the peacemakers. Raise up leaders, Lord, who put their trust in you and speak and act in the power of your spirit. Where the enemy rushes in like a flood, may we see your standard be raised against him. Lord, we thank you for the light that you have brought to our world and how you have created the church to be the means of bringing that light to shine in the darkness. Wherever your light is shining, Lord, may people be brought into the safety of your kingdom, released from the captivity of poverty or riches, sickness or health, exploitation or being the exploiter. May your light so shine that people may see the good things of your kingdom and the truth about the Lord Jesus and learn to follow him. And Lord, on this day, we thank you for the blessing of family and the gift of motherhood. Thank you that we are made in your image and that a mother's nurture, love and care is a reflection of your divine nature. We pray for all mothers and the many situations they find themselves in today. We pray for the children in their care. We pray for the family units they are part of and the legacies they leave. We pray for those who for many reasons have failed in the responsibilities of motherhood. Lord, in your mercy, protect, we pray, the nature of motherhood and for each individual. Bless with your presence through the joys and sorrows, the celebrations and the disappointments, the strengths and the weaknesses, the welcomes and the rejections. Lord, we remember those known to us who need you in special ways at this time. For those experiencing physical or mental illness, <coughs> facing uncertainty for the future, feeling guilty for past mistakes, worried about the increasing cost and pressures of living. For those coping with loneliness, pain, family disputes, or as victims of crime and injustice. Lord, in your mercy, be with them in their need. And show us how we can be partners with you in bringing your comfort and strength into their lives. 
And let's just take a moment to remember quietly in our hearts those that the Lord has placed on our hearts. Lord. Merciful Father, may your word to us this morning be the encouragement we need to respond to you in worship and in service. Bless Mark as he shares your word with us and as we share together in communion. May we recognise your presence amongst us and your people throughout the world. And to you be the power and the glory in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And let's say together in our own homes, our own hearts, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much, Graham. Thank you for that beautiful and wonderful prayer. Thank you. And before we have Mark's sermon this morning, we will sing our next song. Oh, 
So it's over to me, I think. Okay, well, I hope you can hear me okay. And again, apologies for a slightly croaky throat <coughs> and the occasional uh, cough and splutter that might occur. But, um, and thanks to uh, Cecile for reading that passage from Luke chapter 10. Maybe if you've got it in front of you, keep it open. I uh, want to dip into that this morning. I want to let you know this morning, I haven't sent my mum a Mother's Day card for today. Why would I tell you this? Why would I tell you? Knowing that you will now regard me as a terrible son? Well, maybe you're also thinking, uh, hang on a minute, I know how he does this thing. He's setting us up, isn't he? He hasn't sent her a Mother's Day card because, well, he's gonna take one round later. Nope. Oh, you're thinking. I don't think I have ever given my mother a Mother's Day card. And now you really are thinking I am a terrible son. What about flowers? Well, there was that time late one Saturday when I was walking through Beechwood Park in Newport, admiring the wonderful daffodils when I had a thought. That fence isn't very high. So I skipped over the fence and I saved myself a few quid. And that's awful, you're thinking. Entrepreneurial, I thought. But actually, now I say it out loud, it didn't sound that good. And I realised the error of my ways. I will go and see my mum later and give her a card. But I've had to scour the shops, as I do every year, for a mothering sunday card yes my pedanticness even stretches to the card i give my mum today and yet somehow i see it as a, a radical step of unconventional independence verging on the scandalous and yet who am i kidding it's nothing more than a, a little act that brings a smile to my mum's face if you want a radical step of unconventional independence verging on the scandalous, what you really need to do is consider Martha in this incident recorded in Luke chapter 10. I love this story. I love the image of this <coughs> socially radical woman, somebody who says, I don't care what the conventional expectations are, 
I'm going to do what may seem scandalous, but what I believe to be right. Here is somebody who sees in Jesus, hears in Jesus, the permission to be a person in her own right, to take her own decisions, not those dictated by society, and who finds in Jesus <coughs> an encounter with God that affirms her humanity and gives her a place of worth. I think Martha's story is wonderful. Let's, let's have a brief look at it this morning. Jesus and his disciples are on the way to Jerusalem and Martha welcomes them into her home. There's something very odd going on here. A woman with her own home is probably a pretty socially anomalous person. Is she a widow? Is she an abandoned wife? Whatever, she isn't fitting the norms of her community. She's on the edge, we might say. And people on the edge really ought to behave properly, otherwise there's going to be trouble. So what does this woman, who really can't afford any more scandal, actually do? She invites an unmarried man, perhaps a whole group of unmarried men, into her home. What's more, he's a wandering teacher who's already begun to raise official eyebrows and is turning out not to be entirely the sort of person the respectable people want to be seen with. He's begun to challenge the authorities and there is some question about whether he is an altogether safe person to be with. But Martha takes the enormous risk, puts herself outside the social norms and invites Jesus in, regardless of what it will do to her reputation and that of her sister for whom she appears to have some sort of responsibility. Perhaps she is the head of the household. And Jesus comes in. <clears throat> he accepts the offer she makes. He comes in and treats the occasion seriously. He doesn't just sit back and uh, allow everything to be half-hearted and safe. He comes in and he teaches. He is himself and he speaks the things that are in his heart. There is in this such a gentleness, such a generosity, such an honouring of the individual that is profoundly moving. In this encounter, we see an individual refusing the limits put on her by her social normality because she senses in the invitation of Jesus the possibility of something new. And she is determined to receive it. And in Jesus we see a receiving of that which is offered, an honouring of the person and recognition of dignity that is so much the way God deals with us, with courtesy, with gentleness, with seriousness. In this meeting, Jesus is reaffirming that when we offer something of ourselves to God and to the mission of God, it is received and used and honoured. Of course, it does go rather wrong in this incident in Luke chapter 10. This courageous and socially radical woman gets a bit of a muddle once Jesus accepts her offer. And this is the reason why I really warm to Martha. She can see new possibilities. She catches a glimpse of the kind of person she might be in relation to Jesus. And that will give her a new place in the world. And she wants part of that. She wants to be the person she sees she can be in Jesus's presence. But then something happens. Her nerve fails. The inner voices of what is right and proper get too strong, too loud. Yes, she invites Jesus in. But when she gets, then she gets lost in the business of serving, cooking the meal, preparing the sleeping arrangements, wh whatever it was. She can't actually spend time with Jesus. Now she gets frustrated, irritated, angry. We have the record and, and we have, in a sense, in Luke 10, a record of, of the argument starting here. Why is she angry? And who is she angry with? Is she angry with Mary for not helping? Is she angry with herself for getting all worked up? Is she angry with Jesus for not noticing? Luke doesn't actually give us that detail 
but we can hear that she is unhappy. She is flustered and in the words of verse 40, distracted. And so she goes to Jesus. This man she has defied convention to invite into her home. This man she wants to know better and spend time with. And she tells him what he ought to be doing in her home. Verse 40. Don't you care what is happening to me? Tell her to help. She's invited Jesus in to listen to him. She's invited Jesus in because somewhere, somehow, she has recognised that there is a different possibility for who and how she might be. And here she is accusing him of not relating to her, not recognising her, not telling her what he ought to say. How did she get into that state? She's invited Jesus in, yet she is trapped by her own expectations and patterns of behaviour into missing the opportunity that she's been taking risks to gain. Well, Jesus tells her very gently and lovingly that she is distracted. She certainly seems to have her mind and her attention on other things. On the presence of Jesus, well, she does speak to him. On the things that need to be done, well, because that's what she speaks about. On her sister and her sister's lack of proper behaviour, because that is the heart of her complaint. And Jesus points out to her that this scattering of attention, this scattering of energy, is not what is needed. Then there is the difficult bit of the story, as if all that wasn't already difficult enough. Verses 41 to 42 seem to indicate that Mary is praised. Mary. Well, hang on. Mary is pretty unconventional, too, in this story. She sits, according to Luke, at Jesus's feet to listen to him teach. Now, this is a technical description of the behaviour of a disciple. And it's not the sort of thing that a decent woman did, nor indeed a decent rabbi allowed. Mary, too, you see, is defying expectation. Not by not helping with the housework, or at least only indirectly, but by taking the invitation of Jesus seriously to be a disciple. And she is recognised for that and praised for that. The story isn't really about Mary, to be honest. It is about Martha, Martha's choices and Martha's dilemma. Having made the choice to invite Jesus in, she appears to want to carry on with her life the way she thinks it ought to be. And who can blame her? If you invite somebody into your home, it is proper to care for them. It would surely not simply be a breach of social norms, but of hospitality, to have invited him in and then not to have taken the responsibility of being a host seriously. And so Martha makes the choice to invite Jesus in, but then assumes that her old patterns of behaviour and thinking are going to be appropriate to this situation, and they're not. That is what we hear in the words about Mary. Mary has spotted something new, something different, and is prepared to go with it, to let go of her expectations and assumptions and to see what happens. Even in the face of disapproval of the one who is perhaps closest to her than anybody else. Is that what she is being praised for? Certainly there seems to be approval for her willingness to let Jesus set the agenda rather than trying to make things fit according to her own preconceptions. Whereas Martha, well, Martha has invited Jesus in, but perhaps has not allowed the implications and realised the implications of that yet. <clears throat> if she invited him in and then spends all the trying, time trying to care for him, what is the agenda she has? That Jesus comes on her terms? that she will remain in control, that she is in charge of this situation, that Jesus, Jesus should keep her rules. 
which of course is the other reason why I love this story. It's a marvellous story about an unconventional woman who in many ways is a fantastic role model and yet who gets it wrong. She does this amazing thing of inviting Jesus in, of challenging assumptions, and then she gets cross when her sister does the same thing. It's as if having invited Jesus in, she can't cope with the consequences of it, can't manage the reality of it. Because when Jesus is there, the rules change. And what she had thought life ought to be about turns out not to be the case. By inviting Jesus into her home, into her world, she has actually stepped into his world. And it doesn't work the same way. The rules are rewritten and the roles are challenged. And while that might be okay in theory, what Martha discovers is that it's not always easy in practice. By inviting Jesus in, she is having to let go of the belief that she can make her own rules and sort things out to suit herself. And that really is a risk. And of course, it is not just Martha's. Mary is taking the risk too. Sitting at Jesus' feet and learning means learning what Jesus is teaching. So she cannot go on as if nothing has happened. She cannot get to the end of the evening and say, oh yes, very interesting, Jesus, and then go back to her previous way of living. Inviting Jesus in and listening to his teaching, life changes. We see it most clearly with Martha, since the story is about her. She cannot order her life according to her expectations of who she is, and what she wants to happen. She cannot invite Jesus in and then tell him what to do. She cannot make others behave in a way that she considers appropriate. She cannot be one who she was, cannot be the person that she was before she took the risk of inviting him in. And that's the challenge in meeting Jesus and inviting him in. We can't be quite sure how it's going to turn out. We can't control what he's going to do or ask of us. We can't allow him to be part of our experience and then expect our experience to remain unchanged. And we can't meet him in isolation from our relationship with others and how we function. Meeting Jesus is important for most of us who have gathered here this morning. That's something of the reason why we meet, isn't it, on a Sunday? And we might speak of it about meeting Jesus in different ways and use different words and have different language to describe what we mean. And for many of us, meeting him in whatever way is doing something that is slightly socially odd and a little bit strange in our society. Now, some people might judge us. Some people might talk about us. Perhaps not us, because, well, our friends are probably supportive of us. But it doesn't mean that wider society doesn't still regard attending church online or in a building as a little bit unusual. Our risk, though, is nothing in comparison with the risk that Martha took. Martha took a big risk of inviting Jesus into her home. When we invite Jesus into our home, into our lives, we're basically inviting ourselves to place ourselves in a place where we hear him teach us and aspire to live according to his teaching. And we offer ourselves to his work. We can't expect him to fit in with our patterns, with our expectations, with our hopes. No, we need to align ourselves with him. If we take the risk that Martha knew she was taking, we too find that we are affected. It may be less strange for us than it was for her. We might get less angry uh, than she did. But the promise of this story 
is that life and fulfillment and freedom are found in inviting Jesus in and being changed by him. Martha thought it was a risk worth taking. I think he is a risk worth taking. Don't you? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this recollection of an account whereby you, Lord Jesus, visited a family, went into a home, met with some people who were brave and who were bold, and yet who held back a little because they weren't quite sure how to respond to you and the difference that you would make. And these few verses in Luke's gospel <coughs> are packed full of wonder and of hope for us to both learn the lessons that Mary and especially Martha learned and to apply them even beyond what they were able to do in realising that you, Lord, in our lives, make a beautiful and wonderful transforming difference. So forgive us when we have not allowed you to make the difference in our lives that you long to do and help us to be renewed and transformed on this day and for the days ahead for your glory amen amen well we're going to be having communion very shortly and uh, I do need to just double check uh, with Karen and John whether there is one more hymn to finish or there's two um, so that I know it's one more hymn Mark one more hymn one more hymn that's fantastic absolutely so we'll sing out sing that at the end of our time but I hope that that reflection on that incident uh, about Mary and primarily Martha puts us in a good place where we can receive bread and wine so if you have bread and wine uh, with you there is my uh, plate which um, I was just about to say I've nicked from church I better not say nick did I borrowed uh, from church uh, uh, this morning um, I say borrowed in the sense that I've got every reassurance that they've got plenty of other others of these plates up in the building as well and I can see Linda Smith smiling at me because she knows full well that there are one or two more up there so I have my, my proper plate with my bread on um, I also have my goblet although there is only one of these but they'll be using small cups up at the church and if you have bread and wine with you this morning why don't you have them there in front of you now as we as we hear uh, these very well-known words uh, that the Apostle Paul writes and are recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes and so that is part of what we do. We join the company of believers right across the world, whether they're gathering uh, in cathedrals or in barns or in living rooms or in bombed out uh, uh, church buildings. Wherever God's people gather today, there will be bread broken and wine shared. And there will be a proclamation uh, that Christ is risen. And as we remember him in his life and death, we look forward to him coming again. So why don't we give thanks before we receive bread and wine? Let's pray together. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, his life and ministry, which denounced the good news of your kingdom and demonstrated its power in the lifting up of the downtrodden, in the healing of the sick, 
in the loving of the loveless. We thank you for his sacrificial death upon the cross, for our salvation and for the redemption of the world. And we thank you for raising him to life again as a foretaste of the glory that we will share. We also give you thanks for this bread and wine, symbols in our, of our world and signs of your transforming love. Send your Holy Spirit to each home and each place now that in these elements of bread and wine, we may know your presence with us. We may know that you are with us as individuals, and we may know that we form your body, your people, your community. Hear our prayers this morning and bless us for your glory. Amen. So friends, with my plate and my bread on it, I take the bread, you take your bread too. I break it and acknowledge that Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. his body broken for us and his very lifeblood given for us and so with some form of juice uh, to hand and my goblet with my uh, wine in let's acknowledge that Jesus said this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood whenever you drink it do this in memory of me Through bread and wine, we are connected to you, Lord, and connected to one another as we have shared this together. And in doing so, we, we commemorate your death. We celebrate your resurrection. We anticipate your final coming. And for the past, the present and the future, we say all the glory goes to you, Lord. Living and dying, you declared your love for us, gave us grace and opened the gate to glory. May we who share today in this way celebrate both at this moment and in all that we say and do and share with others today. May all the glory go to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen, friends. So before we depart, we'll we'll say the grace together. But before we do that, let's sing one more time, shall we? I don't know what you've got lined up, Karen, but uh do let us know. Thank you. 
over us salvation we proclaim Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord And the coming of the King Hosanna we will sing song which was uh, new to me and it's always good to hear new things actually I think I might have heard it once but um, uh, but not not well known but uh, a good song uh, to finish with this morning so um, uh, John looks as if he's geared up to say something but uh... <laughs> I will but I'll wait till you finish Mark <laughs> oh right okay well I was just gonna get us to unmute everybody and share the grace together and hear that crazy cacophony of voices that um that i know we don't always do but sometimes we do do and uh, and having not done it for a while there's that novelty factor isn't there really of, of hearing the voices but something wonderful about it too really i think so um i'm just going to suggest that well it looks to me as if everybody online is is now unmuted and um 
well, with boldness, braveness, or, 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 or under your breath, feel free to, to, to speak out the grace to those folk that you can see uh, staring at you out of your seats, uh, out of your screen. That, that, one, two, three, here we go, one, two, three. May the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit, Spirit to you in the soul, now, 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 Amen. We all got to Amen eventually. <laughs> we did, we did. And all I wanted to say, Mark, it's only very, very briefly, thank you so much for that uh, message this morning. I just wanted to pick up sort of, sort of one, one thing really, or two things that, that you mentioned there, is that Mary spotted something new and let go and let Jesus set the agenda. And it's great because we could put our names, instead of Mary, we could put our names and we prepare to really um, spot something new in Jesus and be prepared to let go and and let Jesus set the agenda <coughs> and it is a challenge it's easier said than done it really is a challenge but that really resonated in my heart and again the, one of the final things you said is that freedom is about inviting Jesus in and it's a risk worth taking because following Jesus does come with risk but it really is a risk worth taking so thank you so much Mark for that really oh. really powerful message thank you so much so Thank you all for joining us this morning. It's been a real blessing to, to, to be with you on this wonderful, beautiful day and this, uh, this Mother's Day, Mothering Sunday. I hope you have a fabulous day. If you're going to stay for the breakout rooms, um, please do so. If not, you need to dip off or, or go have your lunch. You know, thank you for joining us and really look forward to being with you again next week. So uh, God bless and have a great week.